All right, we are live. Hey there, Laker fans. Welcome to Lakers Detailed. I am your host, Vinay, with my co-host, Raj. The Lakers have just ripped off five wins in a row, Ooh. including a back-to-back, -back, a thriller last night uh, against the Bucks, uh, and then obviously a relatively less... You know, much cooler, got a little annoying towards the end of the third quarter sort of game against the Grizzlies. But for the most part, pretty smooth sailing. All the role players step up. Rui has a spectacular game today uh, against uh, against the Grizzlies. Just keeps firing on all cylinders. I think he set himself a career high in scoring today, um, yep. which was awesome to see for him. Uh, so good for him, too, as well. And, uh, you know, the Lakers win a game without Anthony Davis, which, you know, we know that this team can – be very very bad when Anthony Davis doesn't play, and and the Lakers yeah. managed to win that game. We we get it back to back. We continue, kind of rolling in the direction in a good direction with about nine to ten games left, and you know if we can get lucky, you know we do have that tiebreaker over the Suns. We might have a chance of of maybe jumping them and getting into that eighth spot or the seventh spot, depending on what happens with the Kings. Um, Raj, uh, before we get into the Bucks game, which I think was much more um, dramatic. Let's talk yeah. about the Grizzlies game. But and it, what 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 did you take away from this game, if if anything? Uh, what did you, what did you take away from from that Grizzlies game? Yeah, I mean, not too much. I think any game. It's funny, even I was looking at it. Only four missed games from AD this season, which is kind of ridiculous. I didn't realize it was that low, even when I went and looked back. And I, so I went and checked our losses. First game was against Houston. We got drubbed by thirty four, um, in that one. Then it was that uh, second game against San Antonio. Uh, you lose by 16. Mm -hmm. I believe that was the Wemby less Spurs, if I remember that correctly. I don't even think Wemby played that game. But mm -hmm. in any case, and then it was Atlanta. Uh, we lost by 16. DeJounte Murray kind of closed us out. And then the only other game was the win in Boston. So these games without AD have been uh, pretty destructive in terms of how other teams score. But tonight it felt like very much a uh, serious business game up until the end. I don't know what the end of the third quarter was. I Jake LaRavia went off and hit oh, five yeah. or six threes. Jake LaRavia, by the way, a 25% three-point shooter. He just went 0 for 7 in his last game, but uh, was feeling frisky and just knocked down threes, and um, the Lakers gave him some confidence, so he was able to go off. I think he had like 26 points, a career high for – not career high, but I think that was a season high for Jake LaRavia. But just a very down-to-business ball game. I thought LeBron was really good. Rui just doesn't miss in Memphis for some reason, and then – Vinay went and dissed Memphis after the after the game. Very, very joking Noah in Cleveland-ish. Like where it yeah. was a uh, what do you enjoy about Cleveland? Uh Rui's kind of like Memphis is not my favorite city. So um it's <laughs> a really weird beef. It's a, a a Rui and a, a Rui and a, a Memphis, Memphis beef. Memphis beef, yeah, it is funny. But no, very serious business. I thought this was a nice kind of Win for the team. AD was able to rest because he played a bajillion minutes against uh, Milwaukee. Too, but you no, know, just a, just a solid one. What, what did you take from it? Yeah, you know, I, I really my takeaway was the role players. Like I thought, Austin came out aggressive. D'Lo came out aggressive. Um, Rui obviously came out aggressive. We got nice minutes early on from Jackson Hayes, just attacking the rim um, and whatnot. So it's just like I, I thought. Uh, my, my concern was we would come out a little flat. Because of because of the double over, obviously physically, but then also at the same time, you know, Bron's back, so maybe the, the guys are deferring to Bron a little bit, and you know, we kind of lose that mojo that we had to to finish that Milwaukee game. Um, but they could they kind of came out and and just kind of did, um, you know, they, they kept playing the way that they normally do. And I mean, granted, it is the Grizzlies, so it's it's not like they're playing some super tough team, um, and and they're kind of down to they, they had Bain and they had. Um, Triple J, but you know it's it's not the same team. Uh, yeah. So I I thought so. Roger, I was gonna say this. So usually when Braun takes a game off, at least this season, when he comes back the very next game, there's usually like a heavy dose of Braun in the first quarter because he's like mm. he's like getting himself back in the rhythm of the game. Um, I've seen him do that before um, this season, but this game he kind of like just let these guys rock out a little bit. He had a couple early turnovers, and then he was like, all right, I'm not passing the ball anymore. I'm just gonna keep driving to the rim. I think he had like three straight layups or something like that. So I, I thought everybody played their roles well enough. Um, and Braun kind of picked his spots like he normally does. And I thought it was a really nice win. Some strange lineups again, yeah. you know, that we should probably discuss. Like I I you know, 
we I can we should talk about this. Like, um, I don't understand the pecking order to the to to the to the starting lineup. Not sorry, not sorry, but to the roster. Like, I don't know what Max Christie has to do to get more minutes because he gives you productive minutes, but it seems Switch like agencies. No matter, <laughs> yeah, yeah like, I, at this point, I, at this point, I have no clue what he had. Like, I I thought this would have been a game where you know Max would probably play a lot more minutes. He doesn't get a lot of minutes. Um, they wanted to play Colin Castleton the the day that he like fractured his wrist or something like that. Castleton suited up and able to play. They don't play Castleton. They play Harry Giles. And like I, I like I understand maybe there's some agency favors that are happening in this process. And that's why certain guys are getting minutes over other guys. But it's just like okay, like I think in the first half we ran that lineup of like D'Lo, Spencer, Torian, um, Harry it's Giles. Him. Oh, sorry, yeah, sorry, not here, guys. Yeah, Cam and Jackson Hayes, and that was not a good lineup. Like that, that lineup was bad. And then we ran it again, and that same exact lineup is the one that you know uh, allowed that that Grizzlies team to go on a run. So my thing is like, like I get it. It's the Grizzlies. It's a back to back. You want these guys to be, able, but is there any reason? Like, what do you make of that? Like, because I, I can't yeah. seem to figure out what, what what these guys have to do to get minutes. So what I think it is, Darwin likes to put Cam on the other team's best defense uh, offensive option. So like tonight, Cam's uh, assignment was Desmond Bain, right? Like whenever Desmond Bain, at least when Cam came off the bench, it was you guard Desmond Bain. And look, Desmond Bain started to cook anyway, coming off pick and rolls, pulling up from three. Uh, Desmond Bain is just, you could tell this Memphis team knows that these aren't serious games. So Desmond Bain's like, look, we're down 28. I'm going to start chucking and let's just see what happens. And Bain started just knocking down threes. I think that's what it is. I, I just – I don't think there's anything Max Christie can productively do on the floor that's going to change the rotation, right? And it's kind of scaring me of an A. Spectrum keeps bringing up the ghost of Gabe Vincent's name, just continues yeah. to come up in every uh, Spectrum hit in terms of he's on the trip, he might play. And I honestly don't see a fit for him. I don't see where the role is coming from. I, I think that, that's a talent upgrade somewhere. I just – I don't, I'm not sure where the fit is, especially with Spencer playing as well he, as he has. And I don't really want to go down in size anymore. But no, I don't I don't know where the rotation kind of comes from with those two, at least. I kind of like the rest of the rotation, though. I think it's made some yeah. sense. I I think Jackson Hayes has kind of earned his 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 keep in terms of what, yeah. how he's playing. And he's just giving us an athletic floor that really raises what we need. But um, no, I don't think there's anything Max can do. Max can do. He's hitting his threes. He's cutting to the rim. He's rebounding. I just think they like both of them in the rotation. Um, we'll see if Vando eventually comes back. And I think Vando would just eat, would just cannibalize both of their minutes, right? I'm guessing Vando yeah. would just take Max and Cam's minutes and then just that would be done with. But um, yeah, I'm not sure. Colin Castleton, it was nice to see him out there. Broken hand season. Yeah. Been driving down an hour and a half to LA for him and <laughs> DHS to keep sitting out games. And they just, it's funny because people don't know this, but like the, South Bay doesn't have like an injury report thing. So I've learned now to text like the PR guy for the injuries. And one time I drove all the way out. I was like, Hey, like, why is JHS not playing? Oh, like he got sick. I was like, Oh, okay. I just drove through two hour traffic. <laughs> 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 oh, Where's Skylar? Oh my God. At? But um, no, it's nice to see Castles and healthy. I, I don't think he's ready for the backup center spot. Harry Giles taking threes. That was weird. I, didn't understand that either, but uh, yeah, uh, I, I don't know where the rotation's going with that. But I've liked the team that they're playing well. I, I, like any, I don't give style points, Vinay, for yeah. games without AD. Just just go win, and 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 they did that for sure. Yeah, no, I, I'm with you. Yeah, the, the, we're at this point with with not that many games left in the season where we just have to essentially just try to win as many games as we can mm -hmm. in whatever fashion we can, and and at, and on top of that, try to make it out of those games. Uh, healthy too as well so you know 80 yeah. bump knees i think braun hit the deck a couple times today but you know he came up it, it didn't look like it was too serious but just you know just stuff like that we don't want them to get hurt and i think both of them are very mindful of um not putting themselves in position um to get hurt too at the same time but yeah that the rotation thing definitely cracks me up the reason why i'm laughing so much is just because i because i know you make that try i know how long that trek is for you too <laughs> so to the games. and the lakers are the Lakers are not kind with with their injury reports, or kind with you know letting letting guys know. Um, I'll think about this today, Vinay. What what happened to Christian Wood? Like that was a two week injury that mm -hmm. 
has become two months now. Yeah. I mean, like it, it was sold as he hurt himself over the All Star break, by the way, mm-hmm. um, which is it, very strange. And then um, he's also gone. So I, yeah, the injury stuff is very strange. <laughs> They're very quiet, and then the guys will just end up playing. I remember Gabe Vincent just happened to play the next game, and everyone was looking around like Gabe Vincent hasn't even warmed up yet. Has Gabe Vincent practiced? And yeah. he went into a game. I think he played two games today. I think it was in. Yeah. I forgot where he played, but um, I remember he played like two games and then was immediately when it had surgery. Like, oh, should have did this. That, that was like the Cam, <laughs> that was like the Cam Reddish thing. Remember, like he sprained his ankle, mm-hmm. he was out for two weeks, and then all of a sudden he's playing, oh, right, and right. then he's out the right. very next game. And I was just like, what are what are we doing? Like, why why are we just? Uh, this doesn't mm-hmm. make any sense. But yeah, yeah I, I I don't know that some some of that roster stuff. I mean, obviously, like I said, it was a Grizzlies. It's it was kind of a whatever kind of lineup that he threw mm-hmm. out there. But I was just like, this. Seems like the perfect opportunity to play some of those young guys that we we, we drafted, or you know, m- maybe an opportunity to see what they kind of look like, even in spot minutes. Like, well, what's the harm of doing that? But mm-hmm. anyways, mm-hmm. I, I've you know, I've I, I don't try too hard to figure out what uh, Darvin Ham uh, is trying to figure. I just try to figure. I figure the the simplest answer is is usually the most accurate one, um, and for the most part, it, it's been the case. But yeah, anyways, um, let's talk about the Bucks game. Uh, mm-hmm. I know you did the post game yesterday with with Anthony. Um, but you know, we're now 24 hours removed kind of for, from that game too, as well. That I, I, I just off the top of my head, this is yet another game where I think a lot of the, no, I don't want to say a lot of the fan base, but sections of the fan base were just checked out. They were just like, Oh, you know what? Lakers have no chance, no brawn, no chance. And if there's one thing that we know about this team is that it, even when brawn is out, like they a lot of guys step up in different ways. And, um, you know, D'Lo obviously had that spectacular game at home against mm-hmm. the Bucks. Um, and then last night, Austin Reeves goes absolutely nuts in the fourth quarter. Uh, and then even even further in, into the extra period, Anthony Davis is absolutely phenomenal. Um, shutting down Damian Lillard on his drives and his open jump shots, just blocking shots, just just being awesome, you know, being, being the guy that we did. And obviously, that took a toll on his body. That's why he didn't play today. But this team really stepped up, and it was also multiple times in the games where they were down double digits, and they kept yeah. the team just kept fighting, kept fighting, kept fighting, kept fighting, and there is a grittiness to this team when they're yep. in, like when they want to be, and I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's like they see AD playing defense, and so then they're like, oh no, we we've got to lock in too, or they see Rui playing defense, or or what it is, grab me, whatever it is. But there's a grittiness to this team. It's not always there. Like today's a great example. They're not trying to win this game gritty. Uh, you know, they're not trying to yeah. like, get out the win. They just want to outscore the outscore the other team. They, they don't really care uh, on the other side. But there's a grittiness to this team that continues to show up every single time. Our expectations are very low of of whether mm-hmm. they're going to win the game or they're going to compete in the game. And I thought yesterday was another great example of that. And I don't think. Uh, for the folks that have been following my timeline, this is going to eventually lead into what the later topics are going to be. I don't think people give enough credit to the guys that we have on the team. We're always, as a fan base, we're always blaming the role players for all of our issues, or we're blaming the coach for all of our issues. But we're never, you know, like, it'll always just be like one guy, like maybe d one night, maybe Austin one night. But these guys are all contributing to some degree to help win games when one of our stars is unavailable or when one of our stars is ineffective, you know, for, for that night on the defensive end or offensive end. And I don't think we as a fan base give enough credit to that. Uh, talk to me about that idea. That mm. d- Does the Bucks does that connect? Does, does, does the, the stepping up of performance from our role players in a game against the Bucks does, does that match up? Are you seeing the same thing when, when those sort of situations happen? Yeah. Man, this team is nine games above 500. I mean, like, that's... That's a pretty solid season, uh, honestly. I mean, I think if the West was a different race, uh, every, almost every team in the West, and I think the plan has a lot to do with this in terms of the teams that are going for it. But, um, yeah, I mean, the team is starting to win. I think there's a resiliency, like the grittiness you're talking about. Mm-hmm. That Bucks game started, I mean, it looked – I feel like AD is the loudest with this. Like, he just um, – he kind of wears his energy on his shoulders, if that makes sense. Like, you watch AD, and you can 100% tell when he's engaged and when he's not. First two game, first two possessions I remember of that of that game, Giannis straight line drive right through AD's chest gets a layup, right? Uh, Giannis again straight line drive right on AD. I was like, oh, AD's not 
he's not ready for this game. I don't mean ready like mentally. He's just not ready. Like he doesn't want to put up the physical fight that it would take to, to beat this Bucks team. At least I thought that's how that game started. He ends up been able like 30 points, 23 rebounds, right? Just absolutely um, destroys. And if you look at our role players, I mean, Austin had a slow start, but he's really picked up. I think his passing has gotten so much better. Uh, people love to like clip the two turnovers that Austin has a game and go, what are we doing? Like, why are we giving Austin Reeves the ball? Are we watching? Like in terms of what we need in terms of our ball handling, Austin has, I thought really upped his playmaking, but then he's shooting 46% on pull-up threes since the all-star break. It's like 18 yeah. games Apple now. He's absolutely on fire and he's drilling shots. I think D'Lo, if you take out the December, he's shooting like 43% from three. He's had a really good season. He's already talking about his contract, which I would just like, can we wait till the, playoffs after that but you know Dilo's already talking about he wants to resign which which is I guess is better than um the other way that the vibes can go and I think Rui just being inserted as a starter when we're 20 and 10 when Rui starts and that's um that's separate from whether both AD or LeBron play just whenever Rui Hachimura starts we're 20 yeah. and 10 this season that's which huge. I think is around it's around a 51 win pace which you know if you started that a little earlier maybe this team's on a different trajectory but no i think the role players have really stepped up that win in ball i think our best wins i don't think it's a coincidence it's like when austin and Rui are going off right those are kind of our best wins of the season the clippers win um the bucks win on this one and then uh the boston win right those are all games without one of our stars in there and where yeah. like the role players are able to step up but no i think like what it is renee i think role players it's much easier to see what they aren't yeah right and that's why like uh, i say like shiny new object syndrome like it's very easy to canvas the league and look at players who you don't watch on a nightly basis and kind of only see this shine that comes from them right but then if you go talk to a person who covers that team like oh dude you don't want that guy like yeah. <laughs> like you know there's a, there's a yeah. lot of situations like that and i think um that's because role players it's very easy to do that or even you know players just under the tier of a star player. Um, but uh, no, I think our role players have really stepped up, man. And I like, like, I keep saying this, you bring Bando back. I like our eight man going into the playoffs. Yeah. Like I, I really do. I like our eight man rotation versus pretty much anybody except, except Denver. But no, these role players have stepped up, man. They should deserve credit. That's why like, I don't know, someone said I was an Austin Stan. I was like, I'm, I'm just like, I think it's like, I just think it's important to like put up, stuff that these other guys are doing sometimes like oh i think it's God. important to, to acknowledge that like that's such, hey, a, like, that's, such a, that's such a mild comment that's such a mild insult to get you should I see know, what i get bro uh, oh my well, god I, no, I see what you get awesome for sure <laughs> no but, but no, like, go ahead i interrupt you go ahead go ahead no no you're good but like they're like all you do is you post the awesome stuff like do you understand how well he's playing i don't think people realize this is an undrafted undrafted that's in it. yeah it was in his third year that we're giving the ball to in late in like late games and clutch situations and say go win us games. Like I think it's cool to like document how that's yeah. going in a season. Like he's playing super well. And I think that's okay to put um put out sometimes. But no, like I think these role players are starting to really play well. And you don't go above nine, like and I love that D Lo finally like gave Darwin Ham a compliment as well. And like I think that was the first Darwin Ham positive note that's come out of a post i don't know if you saw it but in the post game versus uh post game of milwaukee he said darvin was great to close that game he called incredible sets which is like goes against everything that anyone wants to believe but uh every uh, every it, day every day i've always seen a tweet come from you know from that section of the fan base how come no players say anything good about darvin nobody says anything good about darvin like every single day people say the same thing and it's like Okay, well, Braun said something nice about Darwin now, and D'Lo has said something nice about Darwin. Now. Granted, they've also been critical of him uh, sometimes, which is, I think, what a normal relationship between players and, and the coach is going to be. Um, but yeah, you know, well, you know what was also nice, Raj, uh, watching mm. Doc Rivers blow yet another big time lead to a oh, team man. coached by Darwin Ham. You know, uh, he was a very popular name that everybody thought that was like a lock to uh you know automatic upgrade compared to darvin ham um and then what ends up happening is he loses to darvin ham without lebron and uh i'm not shocked about that i um i would not put any money on a doc rivers led <laughs> team just because it just he, it just happened too many times now at this point um and you know it, i it believe just in karma it. like like doc rivers on the sideline there is just nasty like oh, yeah i went to i went to lakers bucks and uh i forgot that doc rivers like was the coach and i look over oh, yeah. 
and you see Doc Rivers on the opposite side. I'm like, that is just that is nasty business. Like, yeah. so I'm sure Adrian Griffin is somewhere out there just uh, preying on the downfall of a of a Doc Rivers team. But honestly, I don't think he has to pray too hard. I, like, I think he'll yeah. be, I think he's gonna get his he has wishes. But no, Milwaukee's uh interesting because they're also winning. Like, the, it's a very strange team that wins at a pace that um is enough to kind of get you in. But uh, yeah, the, yeah. We'll see. We'll see what we'll see what Doc so, Rivers does when when it's on the line. So so let me ask you a question. There was a a point in the fourth quarter um, where I mm. think Austin had hit two or three buckets in a row. I want to say I think he hit a three, and I think mm-hmm. he may have had like a mid range floater or a jumper. I, I can't remember uh, back of my mind. I can't remember exactly what it was. But I know he had he had two hit two buckets in a row, um, and I think the Lakers called a timeout or there was a timeout that was called, um, and there was a stoppage in play. And on the very next possession, and I'm not saying this when I bring up this example for the folks that are listening, I'm not bringing this up because um, I'm trying to cause friction between the two players. It's just, it's an observation that bothered me because it's something that happened. And and it's also something that like Braun has kind of mentioned on that podcast with, with JJ Reddick, right? Like um, to, to preface it, Braun on that podcast on the first episode said, I don't understand why coaches just keep don't keep running the same thing over and over again when it's mm, working. Spamming. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he was talking about that that two man game with him and Austin that led to the Clippers comeback uh, or the comeback against the Clippers um, when Braun went crazy from three in the fourth quarter. Right. They kept spamming the action um, that Ham was calling until, you know, the, the Clippers finally adjusted to what it was. So last night they get the ball to Austin and they're basically allowing him to um, hunt Chris Middleton, who could not stay in front of him. Like the Middleton was not moving very well defensively. And, um, and Austin was getting really good looks uh, off of it. And Austin was being aggressive. So, so kudos to him for, for being aggressive in that moment. Austin hits two buckets. You could tell he's in a groove. There's a timeout in the stoppage. And out of the timeout in the stoppage, it, it turns into like this D'Angelo Russell ISO ball, ISO ball which I think mm. ends up going to the left wing. And I think D'Lo take, attempts a, a contested three. Now, I don't know what the, I, I couldn't tell what the play was supposed to be. But after that play, like I, I think it was one of the few tweets that I put like after the game because I was just too locked into the game to, to tweet. I said, why are we giving it to D'Lo? Like, why are we not just giving it to Austin? He is the hot hand. He's scoring. Why do that? Again, I'm not bringing this up to cause friction between two players, but that bothered me because I was just like, even D'Lo himself should be like, no, Austin, you're the hot hand. Like, t- like, like just take it. Like. I'll screen for you or whatever. And, and we saw that happen in overtime, right? They ran that ghost screen, ac- the same ghost screen action that, that Braun runs with AD. They ran a guard guard version of that. And Austin mm. drilled a three from the left wing. But it's just sometimes when that kind of stuff happens, it bothers me because it's just like, why is the train of thought? Like, why is it right then and there? Like what in that moment caused you to do that? Cause I didn't see the defense doing anything to take Austin away. Mm. Did you, do you remember that moment? Do you remember that play? Like, um, I, I, uh, I don't, but I, but I do remember when Austin was continually getting good looks. I don't remember what portion of the game that yeah. is, if that was the same portion. But, um, yeah, I, I think – I'm not sure if it was every time Chris Middleton, but I knew they were trying to involve Malik Beasley in every action. Yeah. So uh, they were trying to pick on Beasley or and, and Dame for the most part. But it was mostly Beasley, and I think Beasley had switched on uh, to maybe D'Lo, and I think he yeah. was the one bringing up the screen. Um, yeah, sometimes they go away from stuff that works continuous, continuously. It's very, yeah. it's very strange. I, I think that's what kind of LeBron – uh, was alluding to uh, um, in the podcast. But, yeah, I, I remember Austin was continuing – because Austin got us back. I think we were down, mm-hmm. like, 10 points, and it just kind of became Austin getting to the basket. Uh, yeah. He had a nice uh, attack of a closeout, was getting to the rim on, you know, crossovers and uh, getting to the line and all that. But, um, yeah, I don't remember the exact play, but sometimes we have, like, a – it feels like when we, we, like, portion out the game in terms of quarters of who gets to yeah. run what during which quarter instead of – pushing out to what's your advantage in each quarter. Like uh, uh, I think that would be the more kind of a, a sustainable way to go about it. But obviously they have a way that they like to play where deals on the ball, Austin's on the ball and LeBron's yeah. on the ball. And then kind of Dinwiddie works his way in as well. Um, we'll see when, when guys get back, but no, I, I don't remember that exact moment. At least uh, I thought that Dinwiddie three was just insane <laughs> that he took. Off. Yeah, that was, that oh, was a little nuts because, because he could have, he could have drove. Like that, there was. I think the only guy who was back with might have been Middleton or somebody. They didn't have a rim defender. It was back. Middleton. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I was just like, oh, you could, you could just drive this to the rim and probably get a really good shot at the rim. And he pulled it. I mean, he made it, so we're happy. But I was just like, wow, like that. That could have been like a momentum flipping the flipping the other way sort of thing. Um, another play was Dame getting that three. 
uh, baiting that foul three um, in Austin. Oh, he was yeah. coming off the, the thing. Yeah, yeah, and then yeah. Austin getting him back with the same, <laughs> with right the same move. Yeah, on that baseline thing. Like, I thought that was great. I thought, like, when we talk about maturation, and I think, you know, um, it, it's funny that people get upset at you for highlighting Austin. You're watching a third-year guard use a veteran move against another superstar veteran. Mm-hmm. And I think, I think because we watch, I think people – are used to watching greatness. Like if you're a Braun fan, what Austin is doing is probably like, ah, whatever. It's like Austin, like I, LeBron's my favorite player. That That's what I think. But it's just like for looking at it on a macro level, this is a role player who's in his third year who is doing like real clutch time stuff against other guys. And, you know, sometimes it's on the defensive end. I thought he had a really good defensive play against Dame, I want to say, where he blocked his shot or contested his mm-hmm. shot, contested him mm-hmm. into a really bad make. And then you get plays like him drawing the foul on Dame because Dame's over pursuing him uh, as he comes off the pin down or off the curl cut. And so like stuff like that is just, it seems so small because to, to other people. But when you, like I said, when you zoom out and you think about the fact like, hey, Rui's probably gone like six minutes without touching the ball or shooting the ball. And all mm. of a sudden we're giving it to him for, a, for, for an open three and he's draining it every time. He's shooting with confidence. He's attacking the baseline, pump fakes out of it you know, drives directly baseline to go and dunk it on somebody. Like, I don't think people understand that, like, these guys, there's a lot of guys that can score. D'Lo can score. Rui can score. Austin can score. AD can score. Torian Prince is going to try and score no matter what when he gets the ball. Like, there's guys that want to shoot the ball, so it's not necessarily easy for them to build rhythm. And these guys are doing more with less. And that's why I think Mm -hmm. we kind of overemphasize the importance of some of these role players because we know our stars are going to be stars for the most part. But, you know, I, I thought, again, just like that Boston game, because he hit those deep threes against Boston, this and, and Rui played great in that game too. Another game where both of the guys that we need to have step up in bronze, in, in bronze void did that for us. And I, yeah. I think that's just awesome, dude. The, the, so this is my favorite win. That, excuse me, the Bucks game is my favorite win of the season. Like, I, I to me, that's my favorite win so yeah. far. And the Boston win was fun, obviously, because if the Celtics, you know, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. But oh. that, that felt that felt more like a hot shooting night that went well. You know what I mean? That like in my not to not to like take any credit away from that game, but that was a big game of changing our season in terms of the uh energy that it flipped. But like that felt like we were just hot. This mm-hmm. one felt like a game we took, right? Milwaukee up 19 in the fourth quarter. Very easy to lay down. I mean, that's a very easy game where I'm watching Clipper games, Benet, and like the amount of times that team just decides we're going to lay on the floor and let the other team roll us over in fourth quarters. It happens so often. They don't even need a punch. A team can pretend to punch and they will just fall back down and, and, you know, let the game um, go away from them. I like this team has some resiliency to it. And yeah, I mean, Austin put up, so he played 48 minutes that game, 29, 14 rebounds, 10 assists. And then Chase, and then ch- while chasing Damian Lillard around yeah. all night. And while Dame hides and won't guard him on the other end. But that's another yeah. point. That's another part of this. But, yeah, the amount of guards that can do that, I'm sorry. That's not a long list just to, yeah. you know, um, you know, give people an answer there. Uh, so, yeah, I thought, you know, he was he was awesome. Rui being benched in the fourth, still stuff that I don't understand. And, like, mm. very weird. Got benched for Torian Prince. I understand like our run was kind of coming during that time, but uh, Rui, again, credit to come in in the overtime. Delo's third quarter is very feast or famine kind of offense, but when it's going, it's going. Hit three threes in the third quarter, brought us, I think he brought the lead from like 13 to seven or something and kind of got the yeah. game into a flow. But uh, yeah, role players stepped up and took that game. I thought Giannis and AD, I thought that was an awesome matchup just to watch one-on-one. Um, but he got the help. AD hitting threes, hit like two threes in the clutch there. Yeah. Took 31 shots, Vene, 13 for 31. I I love that. Take yes. every single jumper yeah. you can. Um, but no, every, everyone kind of stepped up. And that, that's my favorite win of the year. I don't know if you agree with that, but that's like. No. Not yeah, I'm, I'm, with, I'm with you, play, dude. Like, but, it, it, yeah. for, me, it, for me, it's a tie between the, the Celtics game and probably the, the Bucks game because I think yeah. expectations were very, very low for both teams, for both of those games. Um, Bucks, I felt like the game could be a little bit closer just because, you know, like I, I, I think – I think without Braun, the Lakers can survive. Not not saying like we can win a playoff series, but we could survive it a little bit more because we do have playmaking in Austin and D'Lo. 
we do have shooting, scoring, you know what I mean? Like, but Bron, the, the place that we really get hurt is um, we don't have size. Like, so we don't have the size mm-hmm. to match up against a Bucks team without Braun, uh, especially with no Vando available um, in that in that game too as well. So it's like, it's asking a lot of Rui. Rui's not the defensive player or or not even close to the defensive IQ that Braun is. Um, so that, that's where we, I thought we would get hurt a lot. And um, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll tell you what, that Bucks game, the, the reason I had some hope um in that bucks game is we shot horrendously to start that game and they yeah. still only scored like 37 or 36 points mm-hmm. in the first quarter and i was like okay so the defense is there we just got to make shots and yeah. you know once yeah. we started making shots they went a little bit cold Giannis stopped getting his freaking fullback dive plays <laughs> where he's just running into the you know goal line dives or whatever that he likes to do when he's just shouldering dudes out of the way and refs just don't call it um you know <laughs> once those stop going his way and he stopped drawing fouls on that uh i, I thought i thought it, it worked in Lakers favor. but i mean just overall like what what do you think about ad's defensive tenacity in that game mm. because that you know like we've seen times where Giannis will come in and i think he tweeted like Giannis gets up for this ad matchup uh every time uh, every time they play and, you know, they started that game off. I think Giannis's first layup or second – or second, it might have been a dunk or a layup. He went right into AD. Like, he was trying to bulldoze AD to get that dunk on. And so you, you could tell he was trying to send, you know, like a physicality message to, to AD. But AD kind of stood his ground. Um, and he actually, I would say, won a lot of those plays um, oh, yeah. in, the sec- in, in, the, in the late game. What, what do you think about that? What do you think about his tenacity yeah. um, in, in a game like this? I- I thought AD was super physical, um, and I thought he had to be. Giannis is going to kind of push the button, push the envelope on that every single time. And uh, mm-hmm. when Giannis comes, like, full speed in transition, I think that's the places you kind of see where there was a lot of times where Rui was about to take the charge, but then he got out of the way. It was like, mm-hmm. I changed my mind. And Giannis got a few dunks. I thought So Giannis started that game 8 for 10 from the field. Um, I believe he would shoot 6 for 15 for the rest of the night. So eight for ten, he finished. I think like ten or uh, fifteen for twenty-five or something like that. Yeah. Um. So I think he shot for like six or fifteen at the end, and a lot of that was just AD standing his ground. Rui, I thought was really good as well. And Giannis is a guy where you have to kind of meet force with force, right? Like yeah. you can't be soft against Giannis. He's gonna bully those type of players. Very Sabonis, not not comparing those two, but Sabonis is another guy like that where you if you go soft against Sabonis, he's gonna kind of overpower you. Giannis in the same way is gonna. Um, try to dunk on you. And I love that like AD was able to force him into like turn around. The Bucks also play really strange. They don't play a Dame and Giannis two man game as much as you would think. They play a right. lot of isolations. Giannis does a lot of ISOs from the top of the key. And that's really where AD kind of lock into you. Um, and the Lakers stayed home and a lot of their shooters, uh, Bobby Portis was turning into Dirk Nowitzki for some reason. But other yeah. than that, like I thought, I thought our defense was actually um, pretty solid and uh, staying home on guys. Dame got some, tough threes off offensive rebounds but for the most part i just love that we were able to kind of keep Giannis in front of us yeah. only six free throws for Giannis, Vinay, and i feel like Giannis lives at the line against us yeah by the way i just my favorite part about basketball is that like how Giannis has played in nba finals he's an nba finals mvp he's played in hundreds of playoff games those last two free throws Vinay, Giannis won no part of those yeah, he wanted no part of those. Those felt like um, that felt like a medicine ball to him. And then to see AD be able to, AD's had some demons that he has to slay in that department of the late game free throws, and for him to yeah. be able to knock those down and uh, ice the game, put us up four, that kind of closed them out. I thought that was just real poetic uh, to have AD ice it and Giannis go over two. I just thought that was uh, just a chef's kiss kind of end of that game. But no, you have to be super physical with a uh, with a guy like Giannis. Yeah, eighty took the matchup. He took jump shots. We've been begging for this all season. Eighty, when you're open on the pocket, take the damn jumper every yeah. time because what it does is he starts getting those floaters. He starts going the line. He starts being comfortable with the ball. He starts like be able to go into his handle and stuff like that that you don't get if eighty's passive. Um, I think part of that too because he like hurt his leg and so he couldn't attack the yeah. rim. So he had to shoot in a strange way. Um, no, that matchup was just ginormous. What did you see from that matchup? That uh. AD Giannis kind of one-on-one mono mono matchup at the end there. Yeah. I mean, honestly, for me, it's just him. He's got to match it. You know what I mean? Like your teammates mm-hmm. are watching you too, right? Like I think, I think one of the things that like there's, we, we always try to talk about like the humanness of basketball. And part of that humanness is your teammates watching you get overwhelmed with your matchup. Like, and mm-hmm. 
they like we we could see it on TV. And if anybody's never seen a live NBA basketball game, let alone one, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> that features like LeBron James and Anthony Davis, you should go see the physicality that these guys have to deal with in the paint Oof. sometimes. And it's not just him; it's it's guys like Giannis and Embiid and, and Jokic and all these guys. Basketball, as you know, skilled and pretty and uh, you know, agility based as it seems on on television, it is not that. Like there's some real trench work that has to be done in the paint. For and and you know that's why bigs will never completely go out of style because you need a guy who's going to rumble um, in the paint. And I thought that I thought that even if he wasn't having a great offensive game, like I said, you know we could kind of survive bad offensive games from AD. Um, the team has enough shooting. And they're like the hottest offensive team, one of the hottest offensive teams post All Star break. Anyways, um, yeah, we could survive that, but we can't survive him getting overwhelmed uh, by by the other star player. And I, and I thought that. Him standing his ground as best as he could to at least try and stalemate some of those possessions against uh, Giannis, that makes a huge, huge difference. Like even when we ran the switch um, or he's switching off and taking Damian Lillard, not letting Dame just dictate that he's going to take a step back three and you're not going to mm-hmm. be so far down in deep, uh, drop coverage that he can just take this and no, you're not going to contest it. It's like, no, like that was a perfect, like I thought that Bucks game was a great example of the Lakers still playing the same coverage that they always do, which is which is a drop, which is what they played. But Anthony Davis deciding to himself how deep that drop was really going to go based on the person yeah. that had the ball. And it's just like, okay, if it's if it's uh I'm trying to think like Pat Connaughton, um, or the other white dude, I couldn't even remember something green, I can't remember what his first name is, but um one of the other guys. Then okay, I could be in maybe a slightly deeper drop. But if it's Dame, I'm not doing that. I want Dame to come down to my level a little bit more. Yeah. And I, in the fourth quarter, he was there's a dance, you know, like it's one of those things that you can't, there's no metric to explain what that is. But there is a part of basketball where if the big plays close enough, where the the shorter player, the shooter thinks he might get blocked or even tipped if he tries to fire the shot off. It changes for where you know what their decision making is, and I thought AD yeah. did such a good job when he got matched up to Giannis, when he got matched up to Dame, just eliminating that that like um, almost that like guarantee for those players that oh I'm just gonna I know I'm gonna score even though AD is in front of me, and I yeah. think the the rest of the players feed off that they're like okay AD's locked in on his side let me take care of my job let me Rui's like 100%. let me go crack the glass on the weak side. Or, or D'Lo or Austin, let me go crash. Oh, he got a block. Let me go full speed and transition, try to score because Giannis is all the way behind the rim or Brook Lopez is all the way behind the rim. So we could do it. So it's just that that's, I mean, that's what tone setting is, dude. Like, and, and mm-hmm. uh, when he's not having, you know, if he, if he bumped his knee or, or he turned his ankle or whatever it is, or if his shot is just not following, these guys need to see you be you, even if it's not going well, because if you don't, they don't know how to play off of you. Uh, any other way, or it's it's harder for right. them to play off any other way. So, I thought that was great, dude. I I, yeah. I thought really that was really good. Yeah, and I like I don't know how many guys in the league can even like Dame's lost a step for sure. I don't know how much of a step, but he's definitely not the Damian Lillard of you know of Portland days. But still, being able to switch on a Dame and then also be able to guard Giannis, AD's kind of ask on that. You just mentioned the drop coverage, basically like that. Dame Giannis kind of pick and roll. His ask is basically to hedge enough for the guard fighting over to catch up to Dame and then also kind of deter Giannis, you know, yeah. running down the lane. Um, and you talked about the Giannis football plays. Just the amount of times, Vinay, on the handoff where Giannis would hand it off and Dame shoots, Giannis just bulldozing in, yeah. elbows out, stuff that you get killed for if you ever try it in a 24-hour fitness pickup yeah, run. But yeah. but, yeah, Giannis coming in, full elbows out, extremely, you know, dangerous. And Giannis is a great player. And, you know, got to see him live, a player that I, I don't know if you've seen him live yet, Giannis, but um, Giannis uh, is a player that I have. Yeah. Yeah, definitely a guy everyone should go check out. Uh, very a uh, unicorn of his own, in his own ways. Um, yeah. But, yeah, I thought the, the defense was <laughs> awesome. I Not to tag him into this, but I just – I love the – in like the insertion of Rui as a physical player. Oh yeah. I think that changes our honestly changed our season, to be honest. I, like I'm not I'm I'm not in the Darvin Ham was 88 camp of not starting Rui or whatever. I think okay. it's a very easy kind of low hanging fruit to grab. But um I, I like look we're 20 and 10 with Rui as a starter. And I, you know, I think 
the guy that started the season as Rui probably didn't deserve to start, just was not playing well. I didn't, I didn't understand his offensive role, was not physical defensively, was not rebounding. And he's starting to board. He's starting to be a weak side block guy. And maybe those things are intertwined. We always talk about the human element of basketball. I don't know what came first, the chicken or the egg. Was it Rui getting offensive touches so he became a defensive player? It was the other way around. But mm-hmm. I love the physicality and – all those spin moves, Vinay, that used to be mid-range fades, they are now spin move, get the hell out of my way, I'm dunking this basketball. I'm dunking, or, yeah. Yeah, or spin move, I'm going through your body, and like you can't handle it because I'm 260 or whatever he is, I'm going through a chest. I, I absolutely love that edge of physicality because when you stack that upon LeBron and AD, when both of those guys are engaged, and when those guys are engaged, they're super skilled for sure, but they're physical monsters out there. Uh, at their core, right? LeBron's a super skilled physical monster. AD's a skilled physical monster. But those guys, how they dominate dominate is being big physical monster dudes. If Rui can be a supplement to that, I think that changes a lot of what we can do. And then that also allows you, Vinay, to start two small guards. I yeah. you to start D'Lo and Austin and be able to have them, uh, you know, be you know taken care of defensively at least for for one of the guys. But no, I think I think Rui just being uber physical. And that that he had a play. I don't know if you remember this, but they threw a lob to Giannis. I don't remember if this was fourth quarter or overtime. They threw a lob, and Rui jumped with him. Like mm-hmm. jumping with Giannis is already tough, but Rui jumps yeah. with him. They both grab the ball at the same time. Uh, Rui comes down with it, and he draws like an over the back foul on Giannis yeah. by like overpowering him with the ball. And I thought that was just an awesome kind of depiction of that's what we need. Because there's times we saw like Rui, that guy's weighs a hundred pounds less than you. Why is he boxing you out? Or like, how are you, you know, not being able to, like, I just love the physicality that Rui has kind of shown. And I thought that Bucks game um, really, really demonstrated to that. Did you see that as well? Are you seeing that trend with, with Rui as well? Yeah. The that, physical nature there, of him? There was a play. I think uh, they gave it to Giannis in the post. I want to say on the left block. I don't, I don't remember what it was, but Rui was, Rui was, he was posting at Rui and Rui was standing mm-hmm. him up to the point where Giannis spun baseline, but had to wrap him. He like hooked him. And the refs called an offensive foul on Giannis for that play. I think I'm pretty sure that was Rui that he did it too. And but that was like a perfect example. Like, don't just let the guy just bully you. Like you're a heavy dude yourself. Like I understand there's a strength difference and all that sort of stuff, but at least put up some resistance so he doesn't get mm-hmm. comfortably to whatever spot he wants to get to. I, I'm with you. There's something that's clicked. Um, I think you put it nicely. We don't know if it's the offensive engagement that's leading to the defensive engagement, but they're like there's a play in the Grizzlies game today. I'll make sure that I clip it and share it on the timeline um, because I thought it was a really – Rui was having a great offensive game. But there was a play um, – I think Jackson Hayes and Braun may have been on the floor too as well. But okay. um, the ball gets swung to Santi Aldama in the corner. That's um, uh, I think that was Braun's assignment because he, he was on that side. I don't know if the Lakers are playing the zone. And so Braun doesn't run it out. Um, he just, just basically lets Aldama take the three, which is fine. I don't think Aldama shot too well. Um, from three, he was kind of spotty. Uh, so Aldama misses the three, and Jake Laravia um, is right next to Braun. Like I think he kind of comes, he, he, he there, he's there with Braun as that shot goes up. Um, Laravia gets the rebound. Like nobody tries to get the rebound; they just watch him get the offensive rebound. And Rui actually crashes, and it, it might, Laravia may have been Rui's this time. I, I can't remember, so I will have to check when I rewatch it. Rui comes cl- crashing from the wing and blocks uh, Laravia from behind. I think they get they get a transition opportunity going the other way. Uh, Austin gets a transition opportunity and draws a foul or something like that um, in, in transition for for free throws. But like that effort wasn't there before. Like, and I think that effort is starting to show up now because mm-hmm. maybe there's a part of this also where it's just like, okay, I know I'm going to get these minutes. I know I may not necessarily get to shoot it as much as I'd like to shoot it, but I'm going to get these minutes. So I have to make myself useful. It might be a coaching thing. Maybe the assistant coaches or ham is telling Rui as I look, I'm giving you these minutes. You got to do something for me. You can't just be, I can't only rely on you to shoot the ball. And I mean, even aside from that, you, you talked about Rui's physicality on the offensive end. That is so huge for this team. Yeah. Because the nature of this team, I mean, email Doka has said it, a couple other coaches have said it. You can't let this team, meaning the Lakers, bully you because that's what they want mm-hmm. to do. And now we're adding a guy. And, and look, we know D'Lo and, and Austin are not big physical athletic guards. Um, so we're not going to win that, you know, um, oftentimes. Uh, 
but you're adding a third guy in the starting lineup who's kind of built like Braun, like in terms of like the, the, the strength capacity and the, and the size and the stockiness, uh, different kind of offensive player skill wise, but will be a guy who'll put you in the post, try to put you in the basket. will bully you to the rim. If he can, if you have the wrong matchup on him, like that spares AD that spares LeBron too. That keeps their legs fresh to not have to deal with it. Like Braun drove so many times today into a crowded Grizzlies paint and he was getting fouled and they're just not calling it, but he's still finishing the plays and stuff like that. So it's just like yeah. Rui, whatever that is that clicked for Rui, like if it was his players telling him something or the coaches telling him something, or maybe something was internal, that's huge because it fits right into the identity of what this team is. And you need that. You need that confidence. You need that identity. Um, that's the only way we, we can make a run in, in, in the playoffs, regardless of our CD. Let me ask you this, because I think this is a very simplified version. This is not how we really discuss things. It's just I, have a, I go back and forth <laughs> this tonight because I, obviously everyone is trying to find the reasoning why this team is in a four seed or whatever, right? Sure. Is it as simple as if, as, um, Ru if Rui started earlier, we're just a better team to you? I yeah, you know, I, I, I could – I think we get a couple more wins for sure. Um, I don't know if it's a difference between us between us being a top four seed and a and a maybe a five or six seed, but I think it's the, probably the difference between us being like a six or seven seed versus like a nine seed, which is where we're at right now. I think the the margin's a little bit closer. So the 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 Pelicans are in the race for the four seed. They have twenty eight yeah. losses. We have thirty two. So. You know, like I, that's stuff that I like that I go back and forth on. Um, yeah. Like I, I say this just not to defend him. I just I don't think Rui was a deserved starter to start the year. He just wasn't playing sure. as well. So I understood the logic of. of yeah, he, out he didn't. Or didn't? Did, was he? Yeah. Three two early. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, he got hurt really early. He got um, I believe he broke his nose, and then he yeah. had the concussion. Right. Yeah. So those two things intertwine, and that really I think kind of got him on the back burner. And plus, I remember watching him. He just looked like a guy that didn't understand his role, didn't understand what yeah. he was supposed to do, didn't under, uh, thought he was paid to just be a bucket. It was very clear. And so that's all he was doing. Like, he wasn't defending. He wasn't wing side blocking. He wasn't rebounding. Um, and now that's clicked in. And, yeah, it's tough to ask kind of what came first. I just – I think that's the big – because obviously Vando's injury also, right, is a very much a – Big wrench, yeah. What, what does that universe take you to if Vando just does not miss the whole year year? Mando played a few games, and I'm just going to chalk that up to him missing the whole year. Rui <laughs> just starts, and Torian – because Torian looks like off the bench, Vinay. Torian Prince looks like a fine role player, right? His usage is at the correct uh, – in most yep. parts. There's still some – there's still some – Torian, I, I call yeah. I call them like Torian single adventures where he just goes on his own like adventures, you know? It's like Torian Prince and Friends kind of thing where it's like, uh, can you move the yeah, ball, buddy? Can I, you have, can, I tell yeah, you, can I tell you what I think Torian's doing? Torian okay. is playing exactly like a guy who is in a contract year that is going to, the first thing he does when he goes into like free agent conversations, he's going to pull out the career <laughs> stat sheet and he's going to be like, look at how much I scored. Look at my shooting percentages from three. I need $10 million a year. Like he's legit playing like a guy because he'll be doing some stuff. And I'll be like, well, I know, you know, that's not the right basketball play. Why are you doing this? And, you know, I mean, look, sometimes he drives into traffic and he finishes. And it's like, all right, we needed that. Like in the Bucks game, I think he had a play where he caught it, pump fake the three, and then dope, went straight to the rim for a layup in, 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 a, in, a crowded, in a crowded paint. And he scored. And I was just like, look, that kind of small stuff is what we need. That's, you know, ultimately the difference between us winning and losing a game. But like, th like the Grizzlies game, he had one where he caught Braun threw it to him in the corner and he had the swing pass to Rui, chooses not to pass it to Rui and then takes the three instead. I was like, all right, dude, you need to relax. All right, man. Like, <laughs> I get it. I get what you're trying to do, but he's, he's, no, he's yeah. playing like he's in a contract here for sure. I mean, but I mean, like, Vene, the, just not to debunk that, but he's in year nine. I mean, it's not like <laughs> teams have a shit ton of data on Torian Prince. And it's not like Torian Prince is in a role like, oh, yeah, I'm pick and roll ball handler this year. So, like, you got to pay me. I'm in a different tax bracket now in terms of what, what yeah. you got to pay me. He's still in the same role. He's just doing it in a way that just does not make any sense. It's <laughs> he's the most 
to me, he's the biggest, um, like, bad process, good result guy, where even the threes yeah. he made tonight, a lot of them contested, and then he kisses the crowd after it. I'm like, dude, that's a terrible <laughs> shot. Just You weren't even open. You just hit a contested – the one when he was – it was like falling down. They were so contested. He was already like falling down and he hit it in the corner. I was like, dude, like these aren't. And then he had the behind the back pass to Jackson Hayes again in Milwaukee where we're down 16. Yeah. Flashy jump behind the back. Like, you don't even make that pass in any normal <laughs> read. It's just a lot of stuff. But like, again, I don't, I hate to like just, you know, uh, blame one player for a season. Sure. I think it's very easy to kind of put your, you know, laser. It's very, it's much easier to laser blame on one person rather than, kind of having a bunch of people to kind of lose context with, but it just feels like the Rui for Torian has kind of, it's not just about those two Benet swapping, right? It's that that sub moves everyone else into their correct rotation. Yes, fix, right. Yeah. Like it, it puts everyone in the right mode of like, he's now Jackson Hayes can be the direct sub. And now our bench units aren't for, you know, small guys right now. It's like, you have a little bit more, uh situation that you get more uh, ro- uh rotational situations that you can kind of work with and it feels like that move singularly kind of turned around this i think when Rui came to be a star when we moved like 13 spots in terms of as an offensive team we yeah. became an absolute offensive juggernaut we are scoring at a clip that a laker team never really has we have almost a team full of guys shooting 40 percent from three we're having our offense looks like it's um it's starting to click. The ball is kind of moving with energy and pace in a way that just it wasn't before. So that's why yeah. I wanted to ask you if you feel the same way about the just detorian for Rui. That to be honest, as 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 big of like us two are kind of in the end, I think Darwin's a little bit better than people think. That was probably a he stayed with that too long. But yeah. um it's interesting to kind of think what what universe the team's in if, if that wasn't the case. Yes. Yeah, I I think I and I think we've been pretty consistent. A lot of people um think I am a huge supporter of Darvin Ham um on the timeline apparently. Um same group that doesn't already like me. <laughs> but um but like I I think there's you know some stuff has been piled on Ham unfairly and I don't think Ham has had anything to do with it. But I think one thing that he does have control over is just how much he's kind of used Torian um and mm-hmm. kind of overutilized Torian um in his role. And I mean we if you've followed Lakers detail uh, for the folks that are watching. If you follow this with any degree, you guys know exactly what our explanation is. Short explanation is he just, he's just, he's trying to extract more utility out of a guy like Torian Prince and Cam Reddish than they actually can provide. And it's not reasonable to, to expect that. Um, and that's just, it's a coach thing. And, and, you know, we've talked about coaches having favorites and that, that's a thing for a lot of different teams. It's not exclusive to just Darvin Ham. So uh, we don't have to rehash that, but yeah, I mean, sure. uh, your original question was, is that is that lineup change the difference if we had played it sooner? Is it the difference between us being a higher seed and a lower seed? I would say, yeah. I don't know how much higher, but I, I would say, yeah. But I, the only thing I would ca- like kind of put like as an asterisk to that is uh, we don't know what was happening behind the scenes. We don't know if there was like Rui was having, you know, it was a health issue for Rui, if it was something else, if there was politics at play that maybe doesn't have anything to do with the coach. It has more to do with the fact that in order to get Torian Prince to come play for the Lakers, we had to promise him a certain amount of minutes, certain amount of roles. Our front office has been known to do that. Um, it's even prior to LeBron, it's just the Laker way of doing things. We are very much in bed with, or not in bed. We are very much uh, a, despite the Laker brand, our front office can be told by different agents that their player must be allowed to play a certain amount of minutes and that sort of stuff. We saw that with the Christian Wood thing a little bit earlier this year when Christian Wood kind of got benched or, or he thought he was going to start and then he tried to play it off like he wasn't tweeting about uh, the coach. Uh, but that kind of stuff happens. It's it's very, very normal. But Rui's had some sort of breakthrough. Um, so, I mean, that, that, that continues to be good. Uh, what, what what else did you take? Did you take anything else from the Grizzlies and, and, and Bucks game? Uh, no, I think like I, I – I thought the Bucks game really showed like the resiliency and this team is starting to feel like the playoffs are on the horizon. I think that's what we were asking for. Nine games above 500 first time since the 2021 season. Five game win streak matches the longest from last season as well. And it's the largest of this season. Our largest win streak before this was four, obviously, which we just won um, the other day. And then last season it was five in December. So this team hasn't really strung together wins in any type of capacity um the houston Rockets just won 10 in a row just to give an example of like yeah. how much the lakers haven't been winning at, at that type of pace uh houston by the way on the warriors tails um 
really yeah. close with uh you see Draymond get ejected? Draymond, Draymond get another ejection. I just that guy is he, that man is great. I mean, props props to Steph. I think Steph had a really great game, and they and they beat that Orlando team. But boy, that guy is not making it easy for his teammates. Um, you see the Draymond hug at the end of of Steph Curry and <laughs> another check that Draymond wrote that uh Steph cashed. Steph has to cash full cash. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think you follow bill. him too. Uh, my guy Nico. Nico's a oh, he's a oh, Warriors yeah. fan, and boy, oh, he puts these voice great. notes, and it is so funny. To I mean, not not his paid, but just like he's like a hardcore. You could tell he's like a hardcore oh, Warriors fan, and and not just like a player fan or whatever. And so it's just like I I definitely empathize for for that. Like I don't get it. Like I I don't get it. Like uh, I rewatched the play, and I was just like, this play, you weren't even involved in this play. Like it was an Andrew Wiggins <laughs> foul. Like and Wiggins was just like, oh whatever. Like it, it's just like yeah. probably his first foul of the game. Like, why would you not have the the you know common sense to to be aware of that situation? But whatever, you know, players players are human. Sometimes that happens. But I think with Draymond, it's just happened way too much now, where it's just he just some something random and he gets himself ejected. Um, but Rogers, mm-hmm. let me let me let me shift gears here. Um, and uh, there was another episode of of the Mind the Game pod um, with Braun and, and JJ, um, and it was a great great episode. Uh, they yep. they fully invested into play explaining what the plays are, uh, which even yep. I don't know all of them. Uh, I, I don't even pretend to be an X's and O's guy. I always defer to somebody else, uh, you or somebody else on Lakers Twitter that's much more knowledgeable in explaining that sort of stuff because I don't know the terminology. Like I'll explain stuff like there's the down screen to the dribble handoff. Oh, people will be like, oh, that's called this play. I was like, I don't know that. I, I'm just describing it play by play. Sure, sure. Um, so it's that pot is great. It's phenomenal for all this stuff. And I think the really cool part is they're starting to take WNBA footage and insert that into their pod too as well. So I don't know if you got a chance to watch them. In the second episode when they're talking about um, the so an out-of-bounds play, um, uh, they're using WNBA footage of the, of that play being successfully run mm-hmm. or that, just, that coverage being run successfully. I thought that was really cool because I don't think I've seen too many people do that um, that aren't like dedicated WNBA. And it's great, Braun – being you know the stature that he is knowing how many eyeballs he has on that pod um oh yeah uh, inserting that sort of thing in there i think that's really cool uh, of them to do that um and uh so that's that's interesting but there's two things two things i like to discuss uh <laughs> from from that and the first one is not as inflammatory uh but the second <laughs> one will be um the first thing was um this thing that braun talked about um, specifically referencing the the Clippers game. Now, I think these two episodes are filmed together. That's why he's talking about it again. Yeah, it was a little um, confusing, but yeah. Yeah. And so um, he talks in that game about making a halftime adjustment. And basically in that Clippers game, we were watching it. Um, Harden and Kawhi were basically picking on whichever switch that they could get. And um, you know they would pick on Austin or Kawhi would pick on, on Torian Prince or whoever it was. They, they, they basically get to dictate their matchups. Part of the reason the Lakers played so poorly in the first half defensively was because they were just getting overwhelmed. Like the Lakers were openly switching all the assignments um, and that that was just causing a lot of trouble. And so Mm -hmm. um, I remember tweeting it during the game uh, in the second half. In the second half, Braun made a concerted effort to not allow Kawhi to switch off. And Braun in this episode mentions that. He said that he vetoed what the plan was. Um, So... I was like, okay, that's an interesting way of putting it. Um, he vetoed what the plan was, and he decided that he was just going to guard Kawhi and, and not allow yep. Kawhi because he knew that it, it wouldn't help the team out. And I think he says the thing where he's like, I know how Ty Lue likes to play um, hunting mismatches or whatever, and that, that's why he did that. So I thought that was really cool. Um, and I thought J.J. asked him, and we ended up winning the game because of it. Uh, Braun's defense changed, uh, aside from his three-point shooting, Braun's defense on Kawhi is why we won that Clippers game. Like That, that was a huge, huge part of it. Um, and JJ is a really great interviewer because he immediately asks him a question after that, which is the question that I, in my mind, I was like, I'd love if a JJ asked him this question. And he does. JJ said, basically asked him, you know, can you do this? Can you do it all mm-hmm. the time? Because that's hard to do. You know, he's basically implying that. Um, and Braun says, you know, that his competitive spirit, he's down to do that if he has to, but he has <laughs> to pick it, but he has to pick his spots. Now, Raj, the reason why I love this clip so much is not because I'm right, because me and you both said the same thing and people got mad at us. They didn't get mad at you. They got mad at me for obvious <laughs> reasons. But uh, because you and I had pointed out a while back that 
when the Lakers play certain teams or certain matchups, there are stars. It's not just a Braun exclusive thing. It's also an AD thing. They will pace themselves in a way, offensively or defensively, to manage themselves. Because the making the playoffs healthy is really important. Because they genuinely believe that our two star genuinely believe that if they're healthy, they can win oh, yeah. a championship. It doesn't matter what their seating is. That that's the confidence that they built from what, what happened last season. Um, and so Braun kind of says that he has to pick and choose his spots. And I think that's a very fair thing. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But the problem I have is that when we make that observation, people get upset. That's one thing. The second thing is this. I think the team, and uh, we've mentioned this before, I think Darvin Ham, and this is not to absolve him of everything, I think Darvin Ham and the role players have sometimes had issues or struggles reading what mode Braun or AD may be in when they are pacing themselves. Mm. And I don't think that's an unfair observation. I don't think anybody's to blame. I think that's just hard to do in basketball when you have Impossible. two high usage guys the way they have. And I think a couple of pods back, I kind of mentioned that like bronze usage is at one of it at some of its lowest levels. It has been of his career because he's actively trying to allow D'Lo and Austin Reeves to run it. I don't think mm-hmm. it's just to empower those guys. I think it's also because he's like, I'm 39 years old. He says it on the pod. He's like, I'm 39 years old. Uh, he makes a joke about, uh, what was it? it being a 2003 Escalade, oh, yeah. 2003 Suburban. Yeah. Who's never yep, gotten this tire yeah. change, right? Like, tire change, yep. Yeah, like I, I think it makes a ton of sense that he says that. But my point is, is or the thing that I'm getting to, which I'm glad he said, is that okay, when I'm watching, when I see you not wanting to chase Harrison Barnes through screens and he's just taking wide open threes instead, um, is you pacing yourself? Is you saying, look, I'm not doing that tonight. This is Harrison Barnes. I'm not doing that against the Kings. Like it's not going to make a difference. Like I'm just not going to do it. I'm okay with that because I because you said that. Right. At least then I could turn around and say, Coach, like Ham, you've got to see that. Like you've got to see, okay, he can't chase these guys around tonight. And you've got to adjust your personnel accordingly to allow allow LeBron to be who he needs to be while while covering. And it, it might not be possible. Some games just might yeah. not happen. We might have to lose the games because of that. Not because of one player, but it's the long game. But that's an important thing of basketball. It's not easy to navigate around, and it's certainly not easy if you're if you're uh, um, wearing a Laker jersey. Talk to me about that 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 kind of explanation that he gives, or, or that segment from yeah. that pod. So, so you're 100 right. I love that you know JJ followed up with that, and I, I love the just idea of this podcast. Uh, LeBron's a very smart guy, saw the <laughs> landscape and what's going on, and uh, yeah. tapped right in, which you know which which makes sense. Tapped right into the to this type of basketball conversation, but. Um, yeah, uh, look, I I thought it was interesting too uh, when JJ asked him that because he is going. I thought he and honestly, Benet, I thought he was too politically like correct with that answer. Yeah, like when when JJ asked him, "Can you do this every night?" I wanted LeBron to say, "F no, what are you talking? Of course I can't do this right, every right, night. Right, right. What yeah. are you talking about?" But instead, yeah. he he paused and he said, "Uh, I don't I'll know. I, yeah. I'm competitive, so I yeah. can try." No, of course he can't. And like that, I think that's an obvious answer for a guy who's 39 years old. He's obviously not able to – he can't stick Kawhi for 48 minutes a game. Kawhi can't stick LeBron for 48 minutes a game. Watch how the Clippers load manage their stars, right? Um, and I think a lot of teams go through this. Now, I think the, the question that you put at is, like you just mentioned the example with Harrison Barnes. I'm sorry, but there is no making up for one player deciding not to guard his guy. Like, again, yeah. this is not – I'm not excusing LeBron for the behavior and I'm not, you know, attacking him for it. I'm just saying that there's nothing you can do if you're playing four on five defensively. There's just, there's, there's, and, and there's guys you can play off and you just have to live with LeBron mentioned. I thought it was funny. Cause they, they mentioned, I don't know if you remember this part, but they mentioned Luca, how he gets blitzed. Right. Yeah. And LeBron was saying, and LeBron was mentioning, I don't get why the way blitz Luca. I'm like, we blitz Luca every time we play the math. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, what are you talking yeah. about? That is literally our defensive coverage against Luca. Is we blitz yeah. him every single time. But LeBron's like, I don't get why we blitz Luca, and you just can't give up Hardaway threes. And um, last time we lost, because Dante Exum hit seven threes. I was like, that was <laughs> hard team for seven three point shooter. Yeah, that, that, that's probably the right yeah. thing to do. <laughs> but that, yeah, and I, I wish JJ followed up. Like, then how do you guard him? 
Like, how yeah. are you guarding Luka Doncic if you're not blitzing him in some cases? But um, no, for sure. And I, I think that was interesting too. And I think it's obviously like I think anyone watching can tell that LeBron's going to take off possession here, possession there. And I don't think there's anyone ever in the game that knows more about what fuel he needs to keep his tank at to go through a playoff run, right? Like there's just no one ever in history that's gone through as many playoff runs as LeBron has. So he, like, I don't think anyone can tell him Darwin can't go, Hey, LeBron, I think you can use some of your tank tonight. Like, oh, yeah. you, you really don't know how much tank it takes to like get through that. So again, I'm not sure if it's right. And we had this conversation to start the year. What's right. And what's like, what's fair are two totally different asks. Yeah. Um, we probably needed LeBron to be a, like, if you want a top two seed, you probably need every single night LeBron and AD to be physical defensive behemoths while carrying the offensive load. That is just the ask of a superstar. It just yeah. is what it is. LeBron's not 25 anymore. I get that. But it's just that's the ask of a superstar um, uh, in the modern NBA. If you want to be a one or two seed, that's just kind of how that's just the par for the course. And again, it's not fair to ask that with LeBron. But if you want a team that's going to win at a one, two seed, that's kind of the ask. And I think that's some of the frustrations with Anthony Davis as well from both of us, from the fan base. Like, yeah, you. I, I think both of us laud his defense, and we bring it up as Absolutely. many times as we get. You also have to score. You can't go three for 11 against a bonus on every time. Like, it's just part of the responsibility as a superstar. But no, with LeBron, I think that was totally right. He's definitely managing, and he's going to manage. And there's games like tonight where he was always like, I do not respect Lamar Stevens as a basketball yeah. player. Yeah, yeah, as a basketball player. So Lamar Stevens went out and dropped 20 points and just, like, was able to get whatever he wanted. Um, and I'm not going to guard Santi Aldama because I I'm just, there's no, I'm not wasting my legs running out to Santi Aldama right. when I know right. we can put 140 on this team if we choose to, and we're right. going to win. So there's no reason for me. Like, those are the calculations I'm sure he's doing. And I hope, Vinay, these are conversations that are, that Darvin Ham is included in, that our team is included in, that yeah. the medical staff is included. Like, I just hope these are conversations that are happening within a group rather than a singular player going out and deciding this is not my night tonight. And everyone else was like, uh, are you sure? Like, what are we supposed to do then? Like, what is the, this is the, you know, like, so like that, that's the part that I, I just hope oh that there's, God. there's, there's some mutual kind of conversations here, but, but no, LeBron, definitely that's, that, that's a great, that's a great scenario to pose Raj. That's a great, it, it gives me a question that I, I, and I wonder if I asked this question publicly, um and tried to get liquor fans to answer it uh, i wonder how honest it would be um and how diverse the answers would be do you think that lebron and the way he is managing himself do you think anybody in the lakers organization i'm not saying what you hope i'm asking just from what you've seen do you think everybody is on the same page when bron decides hey you know what this season alone just this season that when Braun decides, okay, you know what, I'm, I'm not chasing this guy tonight. I'm not doing it. Um, we'll trade buckets. Um, you know, like I think I shared that stat. Like the Lakers are really good against the best teams in the league, and they beat the crap out of all, all the really bad teams in the league. But like the middle tier teams, the Sacramento Kings, those sort of teams, um, we're bad. We're not good against them. We're bad against them because those are the teams yeah. that are trying to scrap a little bit more to, to squeeze out. Do you think? People on the team know when Braun is in that mode, or he's like he's like kind of letting. Or do you think he's let Darvin Ham know? I because I, I could see the answer both ways. I, I could see I could, I could see where he's told Ham he's like, look, the tape is going to be bad some games. Like I I I compiled the tape of and shared it with the timeline, not to make fun of Braun, just just to explain to people like you guys keep yeah. feeling role players when our superstars don't play. Of all of Harrison Barnes is threes, and literally all I did was compile all the Harrison Barton threes and let people <laughs> come to their own conclusion. But my point is we see that you and I see that because we cut the tape. We watch it a second time. I know Darvin Ham and the assistant coaches see that there must be something where they're like, we get it. It's okay. Sacramento yeah. plays super fast and they just chuck a ton of threes and they hit you with a bunch of screens. We get it. It's all right. Like next yeah. on to the next thing. Uh, and, and Darvin yeah, and Darvin wouldn't be able, wouldn't be doing his job if he ever came out and was like, "Yeah, you know what? I don't think LeBron wanted to defend today. Like that's, that's never happening. You're just never gonna get that in a in a post game, you know, uh, post game quote." I'm not so I'm not, I I don't think, Vinay, there's like some huddle and LeBron goes, "Hey, look, guys, 
tonight, <laughs> it's just y'all on defense. Like, I, I don't think that <laughs> I just, like, can you imagine? Oh like, God. I don't, I don't, I don't think that is. What I do think is there's like a conversation like, hey, we don't mind if this guy shoot tonight, right? Like, mm. like if this guy beats us, we live with this, right? And I think there's a world where LeBron goes in there and goes, Harrison Barnes can beat us tonight. Like, not right, not directly, but in terms of sure, like, sure. hey, I'm going to help on Fox's drive. I'm going to double on some bonus. And yeah. that's why sometimes it looks ugly. Now, I think the issue with this, and my issue with this when I go rewatch these games, is that basketball is such a flow sport that, like, yeah. it, like it's not chess pieces, right? It's not I move, you move, I move, you move. It's not an RPG game. So, like, a lot of times, like, again, fan, fan bases will call, why is Malik Monk wide open in the corner? Yeah. It's like, oh, like, one guy didn't move for 24 seconds on <laughs> right. the, the game. And so, like, you see Austin flying, Austin, and then, like, like Austin, like, you got to close out. And, like, I'm sure if Austin got truth serum put it in his shoulder, he's like, he's hey, man, like, dude, I just made two fucking rotations, dude. What are you talking about? There's four other guys on the floor. Right. Like, so, so I think we go, like, tonight, we went to this game, and we're like, Santi Aldama can have every shot he wants. And Santi Aldama's been shooting well. I feel like we don't move percentages into this either. We just go with the flow on these and we pick yeah. one guy to like, Hey, this guy is going to be a high volume junior. And sometimes we get beat with that example with Dante Exum Dante and Exum. other guys that, yeah, that we just kind of leave open as like our game plan of this guy can beat us. Um, and look, if teams don't have, have a non shooter on the floor, Lakers usually will beat the crap out of you. Cause it's yeah. very easy to hide a uh, not hide, but like put LeBron or, on those type of guys. But that's what I don't think Renee, there's cause I just don't think you can have that conversation. I'd like, what what I do think sometimes what happens though is the team is not stupid. Like it, it's very easy for the team to kind of also be like, oh, this this allows me to take the take the guard down, right? Like I can relax too, right? Like now now I'm gonna play this as well. And so like that's why sometimes like even in Milwaukee, the team was down 19 with four minutes left to go in the the first quarter. It's like yeah, the whole team kind of came out. AD came out very you know, relax and in a malaise and the whole team followed suit and we we're down 19 and obviously we weren't shooting well, but I think like that happens um, very often. So I, I think that's what, I don't think there's like, but I hope again, I hope that this is communicated with Darwin and I'm sure LeBron has to, and like there's only 12 players or 15 players on the NBA team. And like, there should be enough communication with assistants and Phil Handy and all these dudes. And like, I'm sure Le, like Darwin Ham's not stupid. Either. He's not gonna, hey LeBron go by guard Kawhi first quarter. Yeah, like that's the Clippers don't even do that. They don't put Kawhi yeah. on LeBron in the first quarter because they understand that this is a long game that, that you have to play. So that again, so I, that, I don't know if there's yeah, go ahead. So I was gonna say so that I mean I didn't I didn't care to argue that point, but I thought it was funny that he phrased he put he posed it that way. Um and he said that oh, he's the one who vetoed the plan. He vetoed it, yeah. I, yeah, and, and I'm again I'm not saying this to doubt him. Like I think they're I think that him vetoing it is probably him going to him and saying, look. Don't switch it. I'll stay with him. I, I think that's what that is. And I think that is credit to Braun for saying, I'll take him the second half because he's been torching our guys in the first half. But like when you use the word veto, it's just like, oh, okay, you're overriding the coach because yeah. the coach insisted, like the coach was fighting with you about it. Like, no, I'm pretty sure Darvin Ham would rather you guard Kawhi, but he's also trying to be mindful of <laughs> Kawhi taking screens and you got to navigate through screen. They, they tried to screen Braun in the second half. And Braun was not having it. Like he was not allowing the the screen to take him, you know, separate him from Kawhi. So again, you know, the way that it's said, I think it's always kind of interesting to hear it be said that way because I think I think you know Braun is an incredibly smart person. So on the floor, Le 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 LeBron, LeBron goes up to Darwin. He's like, "Guess what, Darwin? Like, I'm sorry, I'm fighting through all these screens." Darwin's like, "No, <laughs> right, right." <laughs> it wasn't. Yeah, let me, let me not say anything because somebody's gonna see this and be like, "Oh, this guy hates LeBron. I'm not gonna do it. I'm already got. I've already got them. I already got them." Yeah, you, uh, you but anyways, them. my whole point of all this is, you know, the, the layers of, of of all this stuff that that go on, and I think Braun just kind of indirectly acknowledging that you know, that he is human and that he does have to pick his spots and he does have to manage himself. I think it's, it, I think Laker fans who expect a lot about out of LeBron in regular season games against a team like the Grizzlies or whatever, when AD is out. Um, and then the fans who think that he shouldn't take any responsibility for it. I, th I think there's a medium somewhere there that he's kind of admitting to right. that he has to do it. And I think if we approach it that way, that like, look, sometimes he's going to do it. Sometimes he's not. 
doesn't have any impact on his legacy. It's just, it's just let's just use common sense. He's a really old dude, and he's got to do that. Um, I, I think that's really important. Like the Grizzlies game is going to be a track meet. The Pacers game we play on Friday is going to be a track meet. Like they're going yeah. to get tired. They're going to get gassed. So it's just like him managing himself. It, it, it is a real thing. So I think that makes sense. Uh, was there anything else you took away from that that specific portion? Uh, no, I, like I, I think that that was understood. I, this is a conversation for a different pod, but I just like I think this is also an impact of the play-in. Like I, I just wonder if the play-in mm. didn't exist, Vinay, like how like how would the Lakers have approached this? How the Warriors have approached this? Does Draymond get suspended that long? You know, like I just think there's this this unintended consequence that the play-in has created, which. The, the creation of the plan was for teams like this who are injured to kind of be able to make that up. Not your season doesn't, isn't a catastrophe. What it's really done is allowed these, you know, older teams to um, devalue the regular season even more. Right. So like yeah. you're seeing these games against the wizards where obviously that should be a game you needed to win. It's down to the wire because yeah. the Lakers know that they have this fallback. And if you talk to AD, he said like, yeah, we don't care what seed we in we're in, which mm -hmm. is great. Like theater, Right, like, oh yeah, they believe no matter what seed they go into, you're the freaking nine seed. Like that's, and if the play didn't exist, you don't even make the playoffs. So I like that again. This is a conversation for a later day, but I think all that has kind of concluded here to a situation where a team believes, hey, like not every game is must win in a territory that it absolutely should be. But LeBron's like, um, or AD's like, yeah, I'll sit this one out, or LeBron's like, I'll sit out the Milwaukee game. But hey, if the play didn't exist, do they sit either of these? Like I. I'm not sure. I, I you yeah. know what I mean? I, I they probably yeah. don't, right? You probably don't get a LeBron City against Milwaukee if I'm not saying he shouldn't have. I'm just saying if the plane didn't exist. So that's another part of this as well that I think just doesn't get taken into account of. But uh no, LeBron is definitely resting and it's good to hear him say that. Um and, and the coaching conversations are, are are interesting for sure that he has on that pod. But um yeah, I, I didn't take I didn't take veto in a way where he was going at ham and that's how everyone in the world took it i 100 percent see it that you know um but i didn't i didn't take it that way and like i would i would kind of like a, a little bit if let's wait till t lose our coach for <laughs> every single time t lose needs to be <laughs> a prop but um no like I didn't, I didn't take it any wrong way i i, I don't think lebron meant it in any like attacking way either okay yeah yeah i'm i'm with you i'm, I'm glad that we kind of came to the same conclusion with that so so raj Let's get to to the to what everybody's the the meat of uh, of uh, most volatile part portion of this. It's only it's literally only volatile because I said something that was I didn't think was very inflammatory, but was apparently very inflammatory. Um, so Bron <laughs> alludes to uh, JJ asked Bron about just kind of his relationship with Austin and just empowering the players. This comes after this this portion that we just discussed, where Bron talks about picking and choosing where he's got to be defensively. JJ follows up by asking him if he has to pick and choose where he's supposed to be at offensively too, as well. And JJ, uh, you know, astutely points out that, you know, he's, there's been large portions of the game where the Lakers have given the ball to Austin or they've given the ball to D'Lo where Braun will be on the floor, but those guys are really the ones that are running the offense. We saw that today with the Grizzlies start of the first quarter. Braun's really just trying to get his shots in transition. The pick and roll stuff is all going through Austin and D'Lo just like it did last night. That's her. So, sure. so, I thought that was a great follow-up question from JJ. Um, and, you know, Bron basically says that he, he's trying to, to do that. And then um, he starts going in this direction where he talks about just like empowering the guys, right? Um, and, and allowing to, them to, to flourish or, or succeed in, in the situation that they're in. And he talks about Austin's game one. Austin, that was the game where Rui went completely bananas. That was the one where Bron fans told me openly, don't expect a win on game one because Bron doesn't, he like typically chills out on game one to, to yep. kind of like uh, collect data. Assess. Is I think the way mm -hmm. that they say, yeah, assess the situation, but nobody accounted for Rui going ballistic in that game. And Rui had like 30 points and Austin closes that game out. Um, there's a point yep. where he hits two or th two, three, four buckets in a row. Um, and we end that game. That's the I'm him game from Austin. We end that game with uh, Braun basically playing off the wing. You know, Dylan Brooks is guarding him and, and uh, it's an Austin um anthony davis pick and roll and uh yep. austin's being matched up against tyus jones smallest guy on the floor the guy that you want to pick on um and you know jaron jackson who's concerned about anthony davis on the roll um uh, they basically turn it into a two-on-two game and mm -hmm. dylan brooks was not allowing braun to, to to hunt mismatches we've seen him do this before he will fight through elbow whatever it takes to make sure braun doesn't get the mismatch so and again remember contextually 
Braun's foot was kind of fried. Like his, he was went into the playoffs right. with a foot injury. So I understand why he kind of played off. That's just the context. I'm just prefacing it like this before I get into what I actually said. So Braun in this portion turns around and says that, you know, like um, he likes to play a game of chess and he, and he's referring to Austin and just essentially Austin, like the, him allowing Austin to do what he did in game one was him playing a version of chess that would eventually pay dividends down the line, um, which sure. it did, you know, if, if you're, I didn't have any issue with what he said, other than I wasn't sure if characterizing it as playing chess is actually what was happening. Um, because when we rewind that game back, Austin got hot and they kept giving him the ball because Austin got hot. I think Braun should get a ton of credit for saying, you know what? He's hot. Feed him. I think there's a lot of props that should go to Braun for recognizing that. And um, if you want to say he empowered him, for sure, I agree. But that wasn't the first time we saw Austin be good in the fourth quarter next to Braun and AD. Like we had seen it in the regular season prior to that. It's just that in the playoffs, that was like the first, very first game in the playoffs. So we, so we didn't see that. That was the first time we saw that happen. So I, you know, not maliciously. Just, just very, just very, like honestly said. I don't think this is. I don't know about him playing chess. This is just good basketball. This is just making the right read. This is just like, let's just put it this way, Raj. If that's Kyrie Irving instead of Austin Reeves, we would be talking about how good Kyrie Irving is as a basketball player. We're not talking about LeBron playing chess. Interesting. LeBron's framing. probably not mm -hmm. saying. LeBron's not saying that. Oh, Austin Reeves. You know, I'm playing chess with Kyrie by empowering him to go further. Like. He doesn't say that about D'Lo. When's the last time he said something like that about a guy like that? And I right, get, I, right. I, I think it's a genuine. I think Braun, he sure. openly said he loves playing with Austin. It's high IQ, all that sort of stuff. My only thing was, it's just kind of a strange way to characterize something like that. It almost takes a little bit of wind out of Austin's sale, sales because I'm like, this guy also played really well. Like, he stepped up with you on the floor. And, you know, based on the coverage or whatever was working, like, maybe we should give him a little bit more credit than that. Because he had proven himself up to that point. Obviously, this was his first foray in the playoffs. My thing is, just give Austin some credit, dude. We went in Boston. We went against the Bucks. I mean, this was recorded at a completely the, the the episode was recorded at a completely different time. But it's just like the kid has shown that he can play. Like, can we carve out a little bit of hey, you know what? Maybe Austin's a good basketball player because a lot of people <laughs> think that Austin's only good because he plays extra Braun and. There's got to be some disconnect, Raj, because yeah, every I, single team in the league says we won't trade with you unless you send us Austin Reeves. But fans on our fan base are like, Austin Reeves is not really yeah. that good. So there's yeah, got to be a disconnect that I'm not that it, I'm not seeing. Hundred uh, percent. So I, I think that was an interesting kind of framing to it of of, of like, would he say that about you know Kyrie? Would he say that he's empowering Kyrie Irving? I mean, the difference there is like Kyrie's the number one pick, right? Like sure. in terms of like Kyrie comes in right away and. Like, let's be honest i think we have a hard time on twitter we like uh sensible people can't disagree anymore it's like i think oh, it's yeah. and and i put your thing in the like when lebron's reading a book and they ask him about the book and he's like oh i don't know <laughs> he just doesn't <laughs> answer a question about it. you know and like i think lebron has an ability to like myth uh like mythologize things like right put things in mythology and like and i think that's his job on a podcast kind of accentuate things and kind of storybook things i think but also i think both things things can be true in this but i think he can but lebron's not blowing a playoff game let's be let's be freaking real here lebron's okay, not, that, sacri can I, can I, can I say not this? sacrificing a playoff yeah, game. Does, can, yeah can, go I, ahead, can i say this uh, i said this to you in the chat too as well i was just like there are people who genuinely think that braun would sacrifice game one if he somebody replied to me saying uh i forgot what the name of the the, the person was um who mentioned it he said he was basically telling me that you don't understand. Braun knew he could win that series even without Austin's performance, but he's doing it to build him up. I said, and, and for me, I was just like, in what? In what? And I, I didn't respond to the person, but in my mind, I was just like, in what universe is Braun okay with throwing a game on purpose to empower a role player? We've seen him make passes the correct play to Danny Green Every time. in the mm -hmm. playoffs and him brick it or we've seen him earlier this season and i want to say one of the in a game against phoenix swing it to cam reddish in the corner to uh to do it Braun never said at the end of those games oh i'm doing it because i want to em empower cam reddish 
or give him more confidence. He said, that's the right play. That's my guy. He'll eventually make it when he has to. You know, like I trust him. He's always going to make the right play. And so I, I, I thought that's just such a bizarre way to, to try and frame it. If, if, if people had just say, you know what? Braun's always Braun trusts Reeves and he's always going to make the right play. And if it's Reeves, that's the guy that's going to make that take that shot or, or make that decision with the ball. He trusts him to do it. That makes a hundred percent. That's a great way to empower your, your teammates. But I don't, there's no long game. Reeves is here. He's been here. So I don't know what confidence he needs. Uh, well, go, I interrupted you. Go ahead. No, no, no. You're good. So I think the point with that is I, I think it's clear LeBron can see like, uh, cause even Austin talked about this right on, on the low post. He's like, yeah. I really like I, I I was giving the ball to LeBron. I was like, it's fourth quarter time. It's yeah. winning time. It's LeBron's time to take over. I hit a few shots. Like I was feeling good, but uh, like I didn't expect I was gonna close the game. Yeah. And LeBron's like, no. He, LeBron, I guess he. I remember Austin vividly was like, LeBron was screaming, Austin, come yeah. get the ball. And Austin's like, you know that Drewski meme was like, who me? Like me? <laughs> yeah, right, so, right, yeah. so so Austin's like me, and LeBron's like, yeah, you like come get the ball and uh, and yeah. win it for us. Um, and again, he, like, did, he did that. Win. He did that to D'Lo, right? In uh, what was the game that that um, there was a game where D'Lo, I think it was against OKC or something like that, where D'Lo was like just frying everybody in his matchup. Oh and yes, yes, yes. He swings it to Bron, and Bron's like, "Dude, what are you doing?" And he throws it yeah, back yeah. to D'Lo, and D'Lo ends up making a three or something like that. Yeah, like, but, that's but, great but, empowerment but, for sure. Hundred, we were up like thirty. <laughs> <laughs> Don't, don't mention think, that, right? Don't mention no, that. I'm, I'm just saying that. Let the mythology yeah. live, bro. No, I'm just, I'm just saying, like, I look, man, that, that's why, no, but the, all seriousness, I think that's what is why it's special with Austin, right? Because, like, that it, it is rare. It, the, obviously, LeBron gets credit for the humility of, like, as a superstar, being like, hey, here, Austin, go, you know, win the game. And it takes a lot for a star of LeBron's caliber to be like, sure. uh, yeah, it's game one of the playoffs, but you're going. So the right basketball decision and even if i'm like wanting to empower you because i know i need you for a long i think there's a fair way to look at that where it's sure. hey i'm gonna need austin for a long playoff run now the idea that he would blow that game is insane that we were people forget now but we were the seven seed playing a yes. two seed who had home court you know like didn't yeah. even have home court right and so like but i'm sure lebron looked at it like look austin's frying jaron jackson jr on pick and rolls I'm, I'm on one leg right um and i'm not getting anything going dylan brooks is leaning on me every single possession austin go cook the worst i don't remember if it was tyus or if it was jaw was guarding austin who, it was it was, it was it was tyus and then they tried to put desmond bain on him for one mm. play and then the lakers countered by running a screen action before they ran the mm. pick and roll to get tyus back on back mm. on austin um, back yeah. on back on yeah and then he was just frying the drop coverage right jaren jack yeah. jr because your point 80s roll um and so austin was going so again like the whole point of these or is for it to be a little bit more of a story tell and i think it just sounds better obviously that lebron's like i didn't trust austin at all i just gave him the ball and ooh, the game happened like that would yeah. not be as fun of a story um yeah. as this but i do think they have a good relationship i don't think it's fake and you're right no 100 is real yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And, and like again our main offense is austin lebron ad like three man kind of actions where all three of them are involved and we're, we're moving to corners the the separation with the fans is strange like i like it to me it's why again i get propped as an austin stand but i i try to document like hey this is this is not normal like it, this is not normal for an undrafted guard to now be your main ball handler and outplaying damian lillard is becoming a better and i see it every time on the timeline people clip his two turnovers that he has and go this yeah. is why austin shouldn't have the ball I'm like watching the same games he's finished with 13 assists yeah, like 48 minutes a game. And gonna, but he hasn't, that many, he hasn't that many assists are going to have turnovers. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. He hasn't missed a game this year. I think he's played like 150-something straight games, which includes Team USA. Like, I, I just like to, again, not to prop up Austin here, but um, with your point about whether it's chess or not, honestly, we'll, the, the real answer is we'll never know, right? Like, we'll just, you'll, you'll, you'll never know. No, no one will ever know if that's actually what it was, but it, it's very clear that LeBron trusts Austin um, a ton. We'll, we'll find out if we'll never find out if that was like actually him, you know, playing 4D chess or not. In terms of honestly, like, I think the real answer is somewhere in the middle where I think LeBron saw Austin and people forget, Vene, LeBron missed the final month of that season. Yeah. Right. While we're in a playoff hunt like this, even more dire, right? Way worse record when we started like our run. It was Austin, um, Dennis, Lonnie, uh, and AD, right? AD came back, a little hobbled as well. 
Um, but we had a whole new team, Vando, Rui, pushing us into the playoffs, basically. Yep. LeBron came back, I think, against Chicago. I was at that game with like a week or two left in the season. Um, and so I'm sure LeBron watched that. And Austin had the game against Phoenix. You remember that game where he dropped like 30, I think, on national yep. TV. He had the game yep. against Orlando where he had like 25 at home. Like a bunch of these performances that I'm sure ticked off something where LeBron didn't just go in game one. Austin hit a few shots. He's like, hey, here's the ball. There was just like progression that I'm sure that came right. up. To, which, for which, to which, is, of... which is the point I was mm-hmm. trying to make. I was just like, they saw how good he was prior to that. Like Austin had mm-hmm. some good games in fourth quarters running that action with LeBron. Like it didn't just magically appear that like game one, he just in the fourth quarter, he was just like, no, you know what? I see something that nobody else sees. And maybe I'm framing it in a way that's probably unfair to Bron, and I probably am. Uh, so I, I, I can take responsibility for that. But it's just like my point was just like you can't say that that guy has got some of the highest IQ and then just act as if he didn't know what Austin was in that moment or what was going on in that moment. I think Bron is one thing that he's been really, really – and I, I, he probably doesn't get enough credit for it. It probably gets used against him you know, because of the Kyrie shot against, against the, the Warriors – is that when he knows somebody else has it going and maybe he doesn't have it going at the same clip or doesn't see an advantage that he can create, he does defer regardless of whatever the situation is, unless there is something that he sees out of it. And I think he deserves a ton of props for that. My only hesitation was when it turns into like, oh no, I'm playing this game long range. Bro, we've been, Austin's been getting mentioned in trades for like the past six months. Like, so we empowered him for what? Just to trade him later? Like, I, I think he, I, I think he is fully invested in in Austin. I think he loves right. Austin. I mean, I know he loves Austin. Like I've heard him and AD really love Austin. They trust Austin. So there's there's no confusion about that. It was just the way he framed it. I was just like, okay, can we just give Austin a little bit of credit because like he had to actually make these shots. You know what I mean? Like he had to split Jaron Jackson and Tyus Jones to get a layup off in in crowded mm-hmm. coverage. You know, what I mean? like there's an actual basketball thing that has to be played um to it that, that that's my only thing that's it's sometimes we kill our guys for not making shots but we don't give them credit for for for, for when they do actually make them and i think you pointed it out very nicely when austin has a couple bad turnovers they can be ugly and that stuff will go viral like austin trying to yeah. draw fouls and looking silly while trying to draw fouls and not getting them will go viral 1000 percent of the time but not enough people share him closing games for us sometimes, you know, and it just it, it doesn't it doesn't float. So that's my only thing. I don't no. I don't have any uh deep seated no, passive sure. aggression for LeBron. So that's, that's, that's no my no for sure. My favorite thing is like on that pod, LeBron and JJ, because it's a very the way that the conversation is kind of framed is kind of a uh we don't really like how the game is today. Mm. Like the player, you know, like it's kind of framed in that light. And I just love like it's so funny because LeBron's still playing, right? So usually that light is given after a player is done playing so like it's very easy to just kind of infer what he's talking about so on the pod lebron's like yeah i hate two for one shots i hate them i don't understand i understand two for one i'm like every game we take the most awful two for one shot i've ever seen like tonight i think spencer dinwiddie took like a two for one 35 with 35 seconds so it's just fun to kind of go in and, and listen to that but um yeah it's interesting like some of the stuff that like again some stuff i disagree with like i remember lebron said no coach ever lets me defend the uh, pick the picker play like this. I'm like, I'm sure LeBron, if you went up and asked like, Hey, can we defend it this way this time? I'm sure there's a, yeah. there will be a conversation where, where, you know, that would happen. But um, yeah. again, the conversation is great. I think it's needed for basketball discourse. I it's, think LeBron saw it. LeBron I, saw a gap in, in the media and, and took advantage of that. As, as in the side, did you see the Stephen A. Smith? like saying that this is like bronze way of did you see that clip of Stephen a smith i think on his show mm-hmm. saying that like this is a really clever way of braun doing it with jj on like this pod that they two have created like this is mm-hmm. like bronze way of like um not getting involved with like first take and espn but mm-hmm. still kind of trying to be in that realm to be able to like explain his position on things. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's, he was almost trying to, he, he was trying to say that like Braun is basically running like media cover using the pod to run cover for himself. And even I saw it and I was just like, well, I think it's just too far. Like I was just like, I watched, I've watched both of those episodes. Uh, the first one I've watched twice. Like, um, and 
they're just talking basketball. Like, of course, there's going to be some stuff that Braun talks about that he doesn't like, and then obviously the Austin Reeves thing, or whatever. Like, he's gonna. It's not going to be just all X's and O's, but like, I don't know. Like, ninety percent of it, eighty-five percent of it, is just like real basketball, just coverages and the, you know, small nuances in the game that don't get discussed. So, I, very. I thought that was bizarre of Stephen A. Smith. He might be yeah. a little butthurt that he's doing it with JJ <laughs> Reddick and not doing it with him. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't seen that clip. I think it's interesting because there's a lot of player pods out right now, right? And a lot of players are trying to do this, um, break down the game in a very smart and analytical mind. And what I noticed, because I listen to all of them as a psycho, like I go and listen to whoever drops a pod, I'm going to go listen. Yeah, you're crazy. I can't do that, but yeah. And and so they all start out like this, right? So like I remember when the Arenas pod came out, and they're doing a great job, obviously. Gil's Arenas is incredible. But it started off as a like, all right, let's break down what's happening. And eventually they all succumb to becoming what they said they're out against, right? They all succumb to becoming, like the Draymond Green show started off very much Draymond. Hey, this is why this works. This is why yeah. our offense works. Yeah. And now it's like, KD, come at me, bro. It's like. Kyrie Kyrie is the score that everybody <laughs> thinks KD is. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So like, it's like, th- those are conversations I could have got from, anyone right like yeah. but the whole point of draymond being there is his perspective on the game so it's it, it's interesting to watch so uh, it's cool to see and jj is very good at like condensing this information to where it's digestible as well it doesn't sound it doesn't sound like a uh i don't know like a classroom it sounds very digestible and it's entertaining and him and lebron have a nice kind of back and forth with it but um yeah a lot of the player pods start out like this and they eventually really like not realize but they eventually just become the devolve yeah into the whatever the headline is they start just speaking on stuff that uh just all these first take and why these first take shows and or what's i forgot what skip show is called anyway but um all those shows kind of devolve to so hopefully this keeps up i like (laughs) it Uh, you see skip shooting jump shots on the timeline did you see that what what world are we in like what universe do we live in oh my god do you think skip Skip tweets his tweets they think that's him behind that it's just I don't. Some I, of the tweets, there's just no way. There's just no I think, way. I think, I, he, I think he dictates his tweets to somebody. I, I don't think he actually tweets them. I think he probably tells. He goes and he turns over his shoulder. He's like, tweet this. And then the guy tweets it out and grammar checks it or whatever he does. But I, I, I saw footage of him shooting jumpers on the timeline. I was like, I don't know <laughs> what is happening right now. Why we're seeing that sort of thing yeah. happen. Um, but yeah, bronze, bronze. Uh, I, 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 well, let me shout out these guys because um, I watched this podcast too. It's a flagrant podcast with Andrew Schultz and akash singh and um they're two buddies that do it to alex and i, I forgot the other guy's name um it's a comedy podcast but jj reddick was actually on that this week and they're they're Talk making flagrant flagrant pod Flagrin, right Flagrin pod, mm-hmm. yeah i it's mm-hmm. those guys dudes are hilarious um so i was like listening to him um but jj reddick was on that and there's a small segment where jj reddick talks about the qualities that a great basketball player has to have to be successful in the NBA. And he lists out the athletic qualities, the physical qualities. And then he also lists out the non-physical qualities. So like, it's not necessarily just IQ. So he doesn't say, oh, basketball IQ. He actually breaks it down to very specific things. And I would highly encourage, um, if you don't, it's a long pod. It's like two hours long. Um, But if you can find that clip, of, of JJ Reddick explaining it. I'm telling you, Raj, JJ is destined for a front office position. Media is not for him. He's too smart with the way he, not the way he breaks down basketball, but the way he thinks about basketball. Like you oh, and yeah. I will talk about, like you and I talk about like the difference between different kinds of processing. There's processing when you catch the basketball, there's processing. When when you when you're closing out, there's so many different types of processes that have to occur that we could list them all out and say this guy's good at this. JJ is looking at it at that level, and yeah. he's looking like he's saying stuff like this is just an example. He's saying that spatial awareness, which is a great way to describe it, spatial awareness on the court is a quality that your best basketball player has to have. And so he's essentially giving the example of Jokic. Jokic always knows where his where his teammates are at all times based on where he's at with the ball on the floor. Mm-hmm. The greatest, the best players in the NBA, LeBron is another great example of a guy like that, always knows where his guys are going to be, even if he's not looking directly at the guy that, that is going to be. 
And that's why you get some of those great passes and stuff like that. So I, if you guys get a chance to listen to it, um, please watch that podcast. Watch the JJ Reddick episode um, because I, I thought it was I thought it was a lot of comedy, but that that basketball portion I thought was really really awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, well, and so well. yeah. Last thing on that, I think JJ yeah. does a great job, and he's uniquely just talented at this. Because I think you know, like people call like Rashad McCants is on the Gills Arena show, right? And people yeah. just call him they all kill that guy. Poor, and, yeah, yeah. He, somebody's got to be a heel, Raj. I have to be the bad guy because you can't be the bad guy. It's not your nature. Oh, no, no, no. It's, it's not just Rashad McCants. Also, like Kenyon Martin's on that show, right? And some of the stuff Kenyon Martin also says, just like you played twenty years in the league. How is that your basketball viewpoint? I just, some of the stuff that he says. But um, like I think JJ just understands not only the game because I think to play in the NBA you have to have some sort of understanding. He's just able to articulate it in a way that I think like a lot of people just aren't able to, and I think that's why it works um so well. So you're able to like really get in the mind of JJ. Not only knows why a play happening, why a play is happening, but he can also tell you like what he's thinking as that play is going. I think that's a really interesting kind of perspective that like I wish other guys were able to do it. Like uh, yeah. Vince Carter's on ESPN all the time, Vinay, and I just. I don't think he's ever said a play name once. Like, it's just, yeah. you know, like, and Kendrick Perkins is on TV every single day. There's no, no like, breakdown of what's going on. It, it's very much a, uh, these guys suck or this guy's soft or, you know, and stuff like that. So uh, I think it's cool where the, uh, and JJ obviously ruffles feathers, feathers on any show he goes to because he's like, what the hell are y'all talking because about in here? You know what? Because there's a, there's a basketball, there's like a line in the sand that he'll draw when it comes to basketball stuff. He's like, okay, like we can joke around and, and do the hot take yeah. stuff, but there's like at a point where like, yep. okay, like let's not disrespect the game now for the sake of entertainment. Mm -hmm. And I think there are probably a lot of players that are mm -hmm. like that. Um, but those media checks are crazy. Raj, that, yeah, that money comes true. in. It's hard not to, not to keep rolling in that direction. So um any any last thoughts Raj? any any last takes before, before uh, the i think uh, i think that's it man we got like 10 games left seasons yes. flying by 10 yes. games left playing game coming up so uh looks like playing game coming up unless denver rested their star tonight jamal murray so phoenix gets a free win off of them yeah um but hopefully we catch them and get it into the playoffs but this was this was a fun week for the lakers five game win streak it's nice yeah. seems like it seems like the team's playing well we're in a good rhythm so yeah. Play, so let's Lakers, keep it up. Yeah, Lakers got a date with next game with the Indiana Tyrese Halliburtons. And so we play them <laughs> on Friday. Another game that's going to be a track meet. Um, and you know, we got to make sure that we, we take care of those kind of games um so that we can try and take advantage of this tiebreaker that we have over the Suns. Um and and, and if should we end up tying them in the standings. But season is winding down. Um there's still basketball to be played, there is still positioning in the play-in and the first seed, second seed, whatever it is, that that's still going on. Um, and, you know, we keep our fingers crossed that our guys stay healthy um, and, and the Lakers continue to keep rolling. But the offense is rolling, Raj. The defense hopefully yep. will catch up, but but the offense is rolling. The Lakers uh, can hopefully add to this five-game win streak. So for the folks that were with us, all 1,600 of you uh, that were with us uh, here live tonight, um, we appreciate you. Uh, like, share, subscribe, whatever it is. Um, we appreciate you tuning in and, um, you guys can always play this back if you ended up joining us later. Um, and you know, hopefully Lakers keep it rolling. Um, and if nothing else, we'll see you in the next one. Take it easy.